It's a warm, sunny afternoon along the lake at Madison, Wisconsin's Brittingham Park. People are gathered under a shelter that's decorated with balloons and Cuban flags. Tables are packed to the edges with black beans and rice, plantains, and shredded pork. Family and friends sit closely in circles, talking with one another. Musicians pull out guitars and congas and start jamming as others hit the dance floor. Who's dancing and playing music? Some of the folks we've introduced you to in this podcast. Armando Rodriguez, Rosvaldo Pozo, Osvaldo Duruti, and Ernesto Rodriguez. Everyone's here today to celebrate the life of Jesus Cisneros Hernandez, an avid chess player and beloved family man. He moved to the United States from Cuba with his father in 1981, a year after the Maria boat left. He eventually settled down in Madison. Cubans from across Wisconsin traveled here to remember Jesus and support his wife, children, and grandchildren. They make up a younger generation of multiracial Wisconsinites who embrace their Cuban heritage. They were taking pictures with the Cuban elders and giant Cuban flags. But there are also non-Cubans here, native Wisconsinites whose lives were marked by the experience of the Cuban exodus to the state, like this guy who grew up in Sparta. I'm just Brian Branstetter. Ernie, Ernie's my brother from another mother. Mm-hmm. Uh, my family was one of the sponsors of Ernie mm-hmm. back in 1980. We, we are good friends, we are good brothers because I love the guy like he's my own brother. Well, I've been your brother longer than not. Yeah, 41 years, 1980. Wow. Ernesto Rodriguez and Brian met at Fort McCoy. And after leaving the base, Ernie moved in with Brian's family. Yeah, they moved into my bedroom and, uh, and they wore our clothes that they could fit in. My parents would go shopping for them. You know, they fed them. They gave them love. I think that was... Very important. Yeah, mom... She was the best, the best yeah, mom. I them. never have a mom. Mom is Annette Brandstetter, who became Ernie's sponsor. So, sort of like a legal adoption at age 22 or 21. <laughs> no, I was 24. I, I told him that my mom, every booster, she gave me, she making me an upside down pineapple cake. Uh, every booster. Yeah. I, sometimes I say, Mom, I don't want to test no more. You, <laughs> and she said, she called me, Benny, happy birthday, come and get your cake. <laughs> they give me everything, I don't, I don't need nothing. They give me everything. Ernest's journey to the United States wasn't easy. He'd been through a lot, but he found sponsors who loved him and cared for him. Sponsors who would help him start a new life in Wisconsin. Soy Omar Granados. And I'm Maureen McCollum. This is Uprooted from Wisconsin Public Radio. In this episode of Uprooted, we're going to talk about life after Fort McCoy for the Cubans who immigrated to the United States during the Mario boat lift. They found homes and got jobs. Some started families. But first, they had to find sponsors. Omar, can you remind us why the Cuban exiles who came to Fort McCoy needed to find sponsors? Yes, they, most of them didn't have family in the United States. They're not U.S. citizens. They're classified as entrants with a status pending, and they had to find or make a connection with an individual or a religious organization. So what were the expectations of the sponsors? Well, mostly sponsors are you know, expected to provide food, shelter, clothing, and there are hopes that they would help the refugees with paperwork and navigating new systems, like applying for green cards. Ernie's story of how he met his sponsors, how he became Brian's brother from another mother, that's complicated. Brian was working as a cook at Fort McCoy in the summer of 1980. I was a cook. I was going to school for hotel and restaurant management. So I was able to get a cooking job at uh, one of the barracks. We were there before the Cubans, so we had like a week of getting ready and familiarizing ourselves. Uh, it was weird because you saw a bunch of people. I'm from, you know, little Sparta, Wisconsin, and you see all these guys that speak a different language and everyone's sort of freaked out. It was intimidating. Yeah. And then uh, the brain trust at Fort McCoy thought, oh, we'll just make them hamburgers and hot dogs. And, and they're like, what is this crap? Well, I remember 
I work in the kitchen with Tony and Joe. Tony was the head cook, and Joe Brandstetter is Brian's brother. And Tony asked me, what kind of food you guys like? It's Cuban food. I said, what the Cuban food? And then I show him, like, how to make a congri and a chicken fricassee and a mashed potato, but not like mashed potato from here is different. Omar, what's congri? Oh, it's a popular Cuban dish. It's black beans and rice, white rice, cooked together with veggies, mostly peppers. And I find this story very funny since Ernie now only wants to eat American food, hamburgers, and lately, sushi. He's obsessed. Okay, so it was that time together in Fort McCoy's kitchens where Ernie bonded with Brian and his brother Joe. And honestly, um, this is a beautiful story from the perspective of a researcher because it's a perfect example of the racial solidarities that were taking place inside of the camp. Despite the image that the Mariel refugees were being given by the outside press and the stories we hear today about racism in our communities, internally at Fort McCoy, Black Cubans and white Americans were getting along and sharing cultures. And eventually, Brian and Joe encouraged their parents, Annette and Roger Brandstetter, to sponsor some of the remaining Cuban refugees at Fort McCoy. It's like, oh, we got to get them out of there. They're too good of guys. They're going to go to Fort Chaffin. They're going to get put in the system. Some of them might even go back to jail. So my parents, having a, a big heart, opened their door. And uh, my dad had a very optimistic view. He goes, oh, we'll teach them English. We'll get them into church. We'll get them working. By this point... Erne actually had a sponsor. He and his friend Tomas had moved in with a couple in town for a month. But he says the sponsor's girlfriend didn't want Black Cubans living there. So they left and had nowhere to turn but Fort McCoy. Erne and Tomas were walking down Main Street in Sparta on their way back to the camp when they saw Annette Brandstetter driving by. And when we was walking, she see us walking. And she recognized me. And she said, hey, Erne! I looked at her. Yeah, hi, how you doing? Annette, no? They said, yeah. She said, where you guys going? You know, we going back to Fort McCoy. He told her all about the conflict with his sponsor as she sat in the driver's seat of her car. They said, well, you guys not going to Fort McCoy. Get in the car. No, it's okay. Get in the car. Go, okay, ma'am. We get in the car. She take me and Tomato to her house. In the end, the Brandstetter sponsored four Cubans, including Erne. The guys helped Annette around the house and in her garden. They were so happy to have a new home. That's like uh, when they were at the house, they had TVs in their rooms, you know. And, uh, they probably, do you have a TV in Cuba? No, I had to go to the party. Yeah, so now, the TV. Now he's got one in his bedroom drinking a can of Coke. Yeah. He's good to go. They also had jobs. Roger hired them to work for his business. This was a big deal, since it was not always easy for Cubans to find jobs, mostly because of racism and stereotypes that Mariel refugees were criminals. Uh, my dad had a car dealership, Ford and Chrysler dealer. So these guys came, basically did the job I did all my high school career, washing cars. And then they got their driver's license. And, and then you'd see them beating around town and yeah. Omar, can you talk about what making money at a job like this would have been like for Erne? Yeah, um, transitioning from outside of the camp to into the community, it's a difficult transition. So having money and having a job right away, it's a big deal. However, these are young men that have been growing up under communism, and now they're trying to understand capitalism. In their interviews, the guys talk about going to grocery stores for the first time and being overwhelmed by the selections of food. They don't have to use ration books anymore like they used to in Cuba. However, they also talk about not having any savings now. And it was mostly because if they have the money now, they buy it. Whether or not Erne was saving any money, he did have a job at Roger's car dealership. Roger also helped Erne get his green card. This was important since sponsors were supposed to help the refugees with their immigration paperwork. Though that didn't always happen, right, Omar? No, unfortunately, it didn't, and this left a lot of refugees in limbo after Fort McCoy. Some sponsors just didn't understand how to navigate the legal and immigration systems. 
They didn't know what paperwork the refugees needed to fill out and received little direction from the federal government. There's also a language barrier, and some sponsors were only in it for their own benefit. Sponsors received up to $1,000 to help pay for food and clothes. Wow, so some sponsors were taking advantage of the system? Yes, and the system wasn't set up very well. It almost seemed like it was destined to fail. Some sponsors collected checks and weren't supportive or kicked the refugees out of their homes quickly. Some families and refugees just didn't click. Other times, some refugees took advantage of their sponsors or didn't understand the new culture. I've heard of people sponsored by farmers or other businesses and forced them to uh, do cheap labor. But this wasn't the brand stutters. They were opening their homes and hearts to the Cubans, but not for their own benefit. In fact, welcoming the Mariel refugees to their majority white community cost them. They tried to take the Cubans to church. It, the, the looks they'd get, you know, uh, if you know that area of the state, it's, it, and back in 1980, less educated, a lot more redneck. They looked at my parents and they called them a Cuban. She's probably sleeping with him. Yeah, just totally awful. At the time, there were a lot of rumors circulating, some true, about women leaving their families or partners for Cuban men. My parents lost uh, a lot of their right-leaning friends because they're like, how could you do this? You, you let them into your house. You let them work for you. It was crazy. What did, how did your parents feel when they were going through that, like losing friends? Was it hard for them? Or well, it wasn't what they expected. Uh, they didn't feel good about it. My mom, our mom was a very stern woman, and she wasn't going to take any crap from anybody. So she'd get all uppity, and she wouldn't care, and she'd, she'd create enemies. Brian didn't want to end up with any enemies. He had his friends in Sparta that he grew up with, and he had friends from Fort McCoy. His attitude was, maybe there's a way for everyone to get along, go to the bar and have a beer together. But it didn't work out that way. Well, there was a fight every night the first uh, summer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> every night. And it was tough for me because I was a neutral. Mm -hmm. I loved Cubans and I loved my friends. But Erna and Brian knew they could count on each other. They were family now. Because nobody does that for a black guy yeah. in another country. And I always call you are my real mom. I had a friend uh, say to me once, Aren't you scared they're going to go and stab your parents during the middle of the night? Oh my goodness. I'm like, they're my brothers. Oh, yeah. so it was really, really so weird. Painful. He just taught me to be open minded. Now. Ernie's always happy. Brian says Erne has taught him a lot in life, not just how to cook and some swear words in Spanish, but he says he's more open minded because of Erne, who's taught Brian to keep things light. Ernest's experience with the Brandstetter was special. He gained another family. And unlike most Mariel refugees who came through Fort McCoy, he stayed in the area. Ernest lived in the upper Midwest over the last few decades. He's worked at the Hormel Foods plant in Austin, Minnesota. In La Crosse, he's worked in the food industry and as a handyman. He's also started his own family here. Ernest has three children, two girls and a boy. And he's a grandfather. Reaching into his wallet, he pulls out a picture of his pride and joy, and his smile lights up the room just looking at it. Yeah. She's my queen, she's my princess, and she, mm -hmm. oh, my, my granddaughter. Uh -huh. She's so funny, so funny. Yeah. So Erne loves his two families in the United States, but he still dreams of his family in Cuba. People who sponsored Cuban refugees out of Fort McCoy weren't just limited to southwest Wisconsin, near the military camp. They were also in cities like Milwaukee and Madison. And one of the people who helped them resettle there was Ricardo Gonzalez, a longtime Madison Common Council member and business owner. We heard from Ricardo in the second episode of this podcast. He shared his story about ringing the church bell in Camaway on the morning the Cuban Revolution prevailed. The next thing is I outfitted my bike with a flag of Cuba and a flag of the 26th of July movement, which I made myself. 
and attached it to my bicycle and went around the neighborhood celebrating the triumph of the revolution. Ricardo's family left Cuba in the 1960s following the revolution. He eventually ended up in Wisconsin for a job. Ricardo fell in love with Madison, where he opened the iconic Cardinal Bar and Rick's Havana Club. And while the Mariel Boat Lift was underway, Ricardo was also executive director of the Spanish American Organization. He set off to form McCoy to help his fellow Cubans find sponsors. The refugees were housed in these bunkhouses made of wood. And of course, the area was enclosed in chain link fences, easily six to seven feet high, if not higher, with barbed wire. And when we got there and I saw all these Cuban, mostly men, just hanging around with nothing. When I saw that, I, I hurt, I personally, I, I, I felt the hurt that so many of my countrymen were in that situation. And I thought, this, this is not right, that this is happening and what are we gonna do about it? Uh, because I knew that I could probably help a handful, but we couldn't really deal with everybody. We just didn't have the wherewithal to handle it all. Ricardo realized he had to choose who he wanted to sponsor. So we decided, well, let's see if there's any families. Let's start with families, mom, dad, and the kids. Uh, Second, uh, women. There weren't many women. There weren't that many single women, no. And so I thought, "Uh uh-huh, let's also concentrate on gay people. A lot of people were thrown in jail in Cuba for being homosexual. A new law had just been approved in Cuba a couple of years earlier called La Ley de la Peligrosidad, the law of dangerousness. And people would be thrown in jail for being gay. Well, that to us was not a criminal offense. So we we chosen, picked along those lines. Ricardo found sponsors around Madison for the refugees, though he says most of them left Wisconsin pretty quickly. Uh, Half of them right away went on to Miami. Uh, That's where people wanted to go. A lot of these people who left right away were going to find family like a cousin in Miami. But then there was a group of people who ended up staying in Wisconsin for a bit. When Ricardo was making those regular visits to Fort McCoy, he caught wind that a group of musicians had formed a band. Since he owned dance clubs and loved music, this gave him an idea. And I thought, "Uh uh-huh, well, let's get that group to come to Madison. And that's when we brought them to Madison, we loaned them some instruments, and they played some kind of a benefit show. Then they had to go back to Fort McCoy, and that's when I decided to get them organized as a group, as a band, and sponsor them as a group. And that's what we did. We sponsored all 12 of them. The group Ricardo Sponsor became known as the Cuban Salsa Band. I got them an apartment over on the 500 block of Mifflin, West Mifflin Street, you know, the famous, <laughs> the infamous block of the block party at which we played in 1981 at the Mifflin Street block party. And I remember we went to this church and the church gave us the money we needed to outfit the band with instruments, brand new instruments and a brand new sound system. I gave him a speech about how music is the language that breaks down the barriers. It's an international language. You don't have to speak it. You listen to it. You feel it. And that concept is what uh, I thought the Cuban Salsa Band would help to generate goodwill towards the refugees. Ricardo thought once people got to know these musicians, maybe they want to sponsor other Cuban refugees. But it was getting harder to convince people to become sponsors as time went on. Because already the problem was that these refugees were getting a real bad rap. 
because there were there were issues involved uh, with the population, and some of it was good, some of it wasn't so good. And the local reaction to the refugees was becoming more negative. Even here in Madison. Even here in Madison. Omar, Ricardo seems like he's well-equipped to help the Cuban refugees resettle in Wisconsin, and even he runs into some big problems. Why isn't this working out as he had hoped? Yes, some people didn't know how to pay rent or find jobs. And not to make excuses for bad behavior, but what we're seeing is a cultural clash that sometimes evolved into criminal behavior. As the Cubans adapt to life in the United States, Ricardo is trying to help people settle with their best intentions. But these guys grew up in a completely different Cuba than Ricardo remembers. This was a cultural clash, even for him. Some people were dealing drugs and getting in fights. They don't know. They don't understand the full extent of the law in the United States. They may think a fight is just a fight and may not realize the impact it has on people like Ricardo, a bar owner. So Ricardo started distancing himself from some of the refugees. He thought some of them were taking advantage of him and hurting his business, the Cardinal Bar. Ricardo's relationship with the Cuban salsa band also deteriorated over time. They played shows all over Madison and across the upper Midwest. But after a year, the Cuban salsa band broke up. There were other extenuating circumstances, like there was a fire at the Cardinal in January of 1981. And I found myself broke. I had no money, I had no, no income. Plus, it was a tough bunch to deal with. You know, they fought with each other. Ricardo says he's still in touch with some of the musicians. One had a successful music career in Chicago. Others stayed in Madison. Some ended up in prison, others involved in drug trade. Families like the brand Stutters in Sparta, who sponsored Erne, they could only help a few Cuban refugees on their own. Even Ricardo Gonzalez and his organization could only connect a few dozen refugees with sponsors in Madison. There were thousands of people at Fort McCoy. The majority of Cuban refugees were sponsored out of Fort McCoy through religious organizations. In fact, United States Catholic Conference helped place the majority of former crew refugees with sponsors, with one report saying it helped settle 60% of the Mariel refugees, or about 9,000 people. Lutheran and Jewish organizations also handled placing people with sponsors, as well as secular organizations. Religious organizations still take the lead on many refugee resettlements today in Wisconsin. But these placements didn't always work out. Some of the refugees at Fort McCoy were Catholic, but people couldn't openly practice religion in Cuba. They had been taught to be wary of religion. So, being placed with a religious family, at times, caused issues. Here's Lilian Guerra, author and professor of Cuban and Caribbean history at the University of Florida. You know, by the 70s, the state is atheist, and it has an atheist 1975 constitution, and people had no knowledge, and I say no knowledge, of religion. They had been taught from the time they were little, those who attended schools in the 60s or the 70s, had been taught that the Catholic Church might be, you know, filled with counter-revolutionaries, but it had been a rich church. But Protestants were demonized in, in sort of very um, empty ways, where there really wasn't any understanding of what their faith was. And so Cubans who would have arrived in 1980 that were then sent to Protestant homes with often very, very religious people, people who would pray around the table, who would take the refugee to church with them. You know, they didn't speak Spanish or spoke a kind of missionary Spanish. I mean, all they were succeeding in doing was hyper-traumatizing the refugee who didn't know how to behave. Lillian makes a good point here. This wasn't my experience, but I can relate to that of the Marielitos or Mariel refugees. When I first moved here, people would often ask me if I went to church or if I wanted to go to church with them. But I had so little knowledge of it coming out of Cuba. I didn't know the Bible or what holidays like Easter or Christmas were. 
When I've interviewed Marielitos, they are products of, you know, a highly surveilled society in which um, national security is part of the culture. And that, you know, hanging out in a church or going to a prayer group, you know, is consider considered some kind of ideological treason. So many of them would just leave um, and often wouldn't give explanations um, for why they were leaving. Um, they would make enough money or they'd be given enough money that they could then take a bus somewhere. So the experience of communism itself really just demobilizes and demoralizes um, the Marielito. And then the experience of having been, um, you know, embraced um, ostensibly by religious people, um, it was just a, a, a disaster. So to get out of Fort McCoy, the Cuban refugees had to find sponsors, even if they didn't work out long term. But some refugees could not find sponsors by the time the camp closed in November 1980. That included around 90 unaccompanied minors. These teenagers became the legal and financial responsibility of the state through the Wisconsin Department of Health and Social Services. They were sent to live at Wyalusing State Park near Prairie du Chien. It's a gorgeous part of the state where the Wisconsin and Mississippi rivers meet. Among those sent there was Armando Rodriguez, the guy who used to meet his dad at the barbed wire fence at Fort McCoy. And one day, they said they were going to take us to a better place. And they took us like almost two hours of travel away, and it was Wyalusing, which is near the Mississippi River, by Prairie du Chien. I liked it a lot there because I was free, and I felt happy. I was going fishing. They took me fishing, and little by little, English got to me a little bit. I never got in trouble there. It was almost like the teens could stretch out once they got to Wyalusing, breathe a sigh of relief. After some had experienced abuse at Fort McCoy, there was hope they would be more protected here. I know when you first showed up at, at Wyalusing, what happened was that you've been locked up in Fort McCoy for so long when, when you got the... Prairie to Sheen, you walked out the buses and no just fence. kept on walking, you know. Yeah. That's John Satori, the art gallery owner in La Crosse. After working in the dental clinic at Fort McCoy, he went to work with the miners at Wyalusing. He likely met Armando there, but they don't remember one another. They were going over, they're going over to the Mississippi River and finding a boat, getting on a boat, going over into the Iowa waters. And, and uh, these uh, security guys were on the walkie talkie and said, Help! What are we going to do? <laughs> They're going that way, that way, that way. <laughs> and only what the bus. But at the end, everyone came back. You know? yeah, we just so, want to explore. Dozens of staff were also sent to work there. They organized activities, classes, and even field trips. We can yeah. take you to a roller skating rink there. Roller ski it was here, right? Well, there was one here. Actually, there was one at, at Prairie du Chien, but they didn't want you to be there. Oh. So we drove you to the high rollers in lacrosse. And lacrosse, I, I, I went that day. Yeah, yeah, I went. John says the field trips generally went pretty well, though occasionally the Cuban teens were thinking about something other than roller skating. Yeah, I mean, they were teenagers. And I mean, if we lost them at the bowling alley or whatever it is, we'd maybe find them behind the bowling alley with some girl they found in the, in the roller, roller skate rink, you know. <laughs> and they were always enthused about these Latin Americans because, you know, like, they were speaking differently and it was cool, you know, so. And it was at Wyalusing that Armando met someone who would change his life. So there was an American, white American, who loved us very much and we loved him very much. And he would take us fishing and walking around. And I asked the American if he could be my dad one day. He looked me in the eye and didn't answer me. That same night, he called me with an interpreter and he told me that yes, that he was going to take me home. Armando left Wyalusing and moved into his new home with Dennis and Nancy Maloney in Madison on December 13, 1980. It was his 18th birthday. I was emotional because I never had that. I got a picture where I was, like, looking the cake, like. Yo, for lo mejor. Those two and a half years were the best years of my life in the United States. I was 100% well with them. I was enrolled in Madison Memorial where I played soccer for the team. 
I was well, but I kept wanting more. Armando lived with his sponsors for about two and a half years. And while he says they were his best years in the United States, he felt like something was missing. I felt lonely. I was the only Cuban there. The rest of the Cubans were in Milwaukee or on the black side of town, east side. And it was around this time that Armando says he started getting into trouble, doing things like stealing cars and smoking weed. I started hanging out with Cubans, but I didn't know they were not in school. They were minors, just like me. They were stealing cars. They were doing things I had not done in a long time. I don't blame anyone. I blame myself. But I started little by little to do the things they were doing. Then my sponsor dad came to me one day and all the Cubans were very happy because they knew him. He looked at me and knew right away that my situation was not great. He brought me all my soccer gear. He wanted me to focus on soccer, but he didn't realize that I was already gone to the other side. That hurt me. They were petty crimes, yes, but they were happening daily. We were stealing cars, mostly. We wanted music and women. Today, Armando is in his 50s. He works in Madison. He has a daughter. And even decades later, you can see the regrets and sadness in Armando's eyes when he talks about what happened. If I could change something about my past, it would be to finish high school in Madison. We weren't thinking about making it. We weren't talking to each other about this either. We all forgot about our sponsors, and we also wanted to get away from the situation in Cuba. He also tried to make it right with his sponsors. Unfortunately, he could only make amends with one of them, Nancy. After Dennis died in an accident, she was in a lot of pain, and I wanted to find her and pay my respect. When I found her, she was very happy and talked for many hours. And I asked for her forgiveness for all the many things that had gone wrong after I left the house. After the break, how Mario refugees have helped each other through hard times. You're listening to Uprooted from Wisconsin Public Radio. Secret meetings, deleted documents, and a case that went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. The story behind Wisconsin's electoral maps is anything but boring. Hi, I'm Bridget Bowden, co-host of WPR Reports Mapped Out. It's an investigative podcast that gives you the lowdown on Wisconsin's redistricting past and what it means for its legislative future. Get the whole story and subscribe at WPR.org slash mapped out or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for joining me, Maureen McCollum, as we uncover stories of Cuban exiles whose lives were uprooted after the Mariel boat lift. They're bus drivers, fathers, and musicians sharing their challenges and opportunities of finding a home in Wisconsin. WPR Reports, Uprooted, is made possible by listener contributions. Your gift now at wpr.org slash donate ensures you and your community have access to high-quality journalism and storytelling. Instruments are all over the place in the living room of Ernesto Rodriguez and Rodosvaldo Pozo, or Nino. They share this home in La Crosse, Wisconsin, and here, music is everything. Looking for an instrument? They likely have it. Guitars, a saxophone, a keyboard. Can you explain your what you have right here? Well, I have here a uh, bongo, two bongo. These are one-of-a-kind, striped, colorful bongos. Uh, one is with a Cuban flag on it, because I'm from Cuba. And I know it's from Green Bay, because it's my favorite football team. Go Pack Go! Yeah, go Pack Go! The living room walls also reflect the lives of two men living between two worlds. Nino holds a trumpet as he points out family photos and Cuban artwork. Oh, yeah. 
And there's a big Miller Lite Packers flag on the wall. It's very Wisconsin. Slowly, more Cuban Wisconsinites start showing up to jam. One of the musicians here, another Cuban exile who arrived in Wisconsin following the Mario boat lift. Okay, well, my full name is Marcos Andres Hernandez Calderon. Very, very little name. I have to deal with that for the rest of my life. Marcos also lives in La Crosse. He's actually close friends with Erne and Nino. They're all practically brothers. Marcos picks up a guiro, a percussion instrument, and the group starts playing. It's like they're all transported from this living room back to their homes in Cuba. Marcos was born in 1957 and grew up in my hometown, Havana. But Marcos is from the vibrant, touristy neighborhood called Vedado. In the early 1960s, Havana was the epicenter of culture. Because of its proximity to the United States, you have music, nightlife, casinos. It's urban, and there's a lot more consumerism. Uh, when I was growing up, you know, in my area, it was uh, pretty much like being in Vegas. You know, back in the day, you hear different languages, people walking around and doing uh, their own things out there. As a kid, Marcos loved swimming in the ocean and playing marbles with his friends. When he was about 12, he got paid to wash and park cars across from the luxurious Hotel Capri. And they have a, a garage in there. And I got together with a lot of all those older people. And they play chess and dominoes and all kinds of things out there, drinking coffee. Sometimes I was the coffee maker. I go steal my mother's coffee and make coffee for them too. And uh, they were out there in the garage and I started learning how to wash car. And I, they were paying me, if I remember, 35, 40 cents, something like that, for washing the car. But the, I get to drive it. Those drives started a lifelong love of cars for Marcos. I, I, I remember it was in 1957, I never forget that, a Chevrolet Impala, that was the first car I drive, you know, way, very, very long car and like that. And, and my dad was helping me steering and, and all that. But after that, I, I, I love driving. Marcos had a much different childhood than his friends Nino and Ernie. He didn't serve in the military due to a leg injury. He also never went to Cuban prison. But like the others, he wasn't a fan of the government. He wanted to drive more cars, travel, see some of the world. That wasn't what the revolution expected of him. You cannot leave the country to visit it anywhere, to come here and go back in the one where the country, the communists take over, and then Cuba become a prison. This is what I like to say about that. And as the Mariel boat lift got underway, Marcos saw his opportunity to get out of Cuba. My, my mother was the first one who told me, you better get out here because you have no future here. A lot of Cubans have heard that from their mothers. So with his mother's encouragement, Marcos made his way to the port of Mariel. As he boarded the boat bound for the United States, he was heartbroken. And all I was thinking, when am I going to see my family again? If I even going to make to the place I was going, you know, how, what, what is my life? What is my new life is going to be in that place? And it was sad. Okay? And today is still sad. Marcos landed in Key West the day he turned 23. Unlike his friends Erne and Osvaldo, when he stood on the shores of Florida, he wasn't excited for his new life. He didn't care much about apples and Coca-Cola the way they did. He was crushed that he had to leave his old life. And shortly after landing in Florida, Marcos was sent off to Fort McCoy. And this is something Marcos doesn't talk about a lot. He doesn't mention much of what happened at the camp. He's told me that he felt like he was in prison, but at least he wasn't there for very long. Uh, when I arrived at Fort McCoy, I believe I wasn't there for maybe 25 days. Because a beautiful family, they were working in one of the messes that I was there eating. This was a family of farmers working in the mess hall who ended up sponsoring Marcos. We talk, you know, and I, I know a tiny little bit English, not enough to defend myself, but at least to most understand what they were saying, the why they understand me. 
and they helped me, you know, the communications of they to sponsor me from that place, and they sponsored me to the farm. The family didn't know Spanish, but the mom bought a dictionary to try to communicate with Marcos and the others. They also developed their own sign language and drew things to communicate with one another. Eventually, Marcos moved out on his own and needed to find work. Back in Cuba, he studied electrical plant engineering, but he struggled with school in the United States since he had a hard time writing in English. Omar, did many Cuban refugees have access to English classes? Uh, It depends. Uh, There was general access through Wisconsin's uh, technical colleges offering ESL language courses, but taking English classes doesn't guarantee you success in your community or in your professional life. So not many of the refugees really stuck with them. So how did they learn the language? Was it mostly outside the classroom? Yeah, many of the Cubans just figured out English on their own. It's interesting for me to hear how, uh, in some ways, they developed their own versions of Spanish and English with code switching and slang. How so? Well, the example I always use is the word pony, which they use all the time. And it's uh, the third person conjugation of the verb to put in Spanish. But then they use that word in every instance where the English word put comes up. So when I put my hat on, Edne would say, when I pawn my hat on. And he says that all the time. Why do you think he does this? I think it's a way of cultural resistance. Um, They know the English word. I've heard them say it many times, but they don't want to use it. You know, I talk to her and I say, I know you know the English put, Why are you saying pony? And they just don't care. It's a form of cultural survival. Do you have another example? Uh, Yes, this also happens in um, the ways in which they uh, connect with Cuban culture and protect that idea of the Cuban culture that they have. For example, they will use the word perol to refer to every car. And that's um, a word that comes from the 1980s, 1970s, late 1970s in Cuba. You know, it's a slang word from the city, a word that people will use in songs, in popular songs. Um, And they still use that word to refer to a car in the United States. And it might be why some people in the U.S. call all soda or pop like Coke. Correct. Uh, And in the case of the Cuban refugees, their language is stuck in the 1980s. They use slang from the 70s, late 70s and 80s. Talking about romance, talking about songs from the 80s, talking about cultural references from uh, when they left the island. It's super fascinating to me because it's almost like their language is a time capsule. It's like if I was still regularly using the words like tubular or cowabunga. Exactly. All right. So in the end, if a Cuban refugee really struggled with the English language, uh, this was going to have an impact on them. Yeah, it was hard to find housing, communicate with new neighbors, get medical treatment, straighten things out with police, and of course, get jobs. For Marcos, these kinds of struggles meant he did not go back to engineering school. Instead, he found other jobs. He worked at a food bank in Minnesota for more than 10 years, and his career has always involved one of his first loves, cars. I drive uh, many, many different type of transportation out, out there. I drive for handicap buses and vans and limousine, taxis, city buses. I did a lot of drivers out there until I moved here. Now I moved to Tomar and from Tomar I found I had a, a, a job in here driving as a truck driver too. And this is when they discovered... But his favorite job was driving people with disabilities. Look at these people. They want to get out of the house. They wanted to meet with other people. They wanted to go to work. I mean, it was amazing how they they just want to go out there. They don't feel sorry for themselves. They say, I'm still alive, so I'm going to go ahead and do as much as I can. Because sometimes, somewhere, somehow, I was feeling that I was them. And I still feel that I am some of those people in there. You know, because uh, the way I feel... Marcos isn't driving people anymore. He's been diagnosed with bone cancer, and his doctors don't want him working. Well, I'm surviving. I'm praying to God every day. You know, we got a good friend of people. Good yeah, and, and this is what keeps you going. You know, when you sad, when you up, when you down, when you happy, whatever you go to those people that you know that they know they're gonna listen to you because they have been going through that same thing you have. 
you tell to them and some ways somehow a release. Mm-hmm. You pain, you hurt, your feelings. The Cuban community in La Crosse, Marcos's friends and chosen family are supporting him through this, and playing music helps him immensely. These jam sessions in the living room, they mean the world to these guys, Marcos, Erne, and Nino. One thing we have in Cuba, neighbor. Hey, knock at the door. Excuse me, do you have a, a cup of sugar? Yeah, go ahead. Then you go to the neighbor, you got a cup of rice? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. You know, we hope that you're community. They've all been through so much together and have so many similar experiences. Growing up in Cuba during the revolution, surviving a treacherous boat ride across the Florida Straits, waiting at Fort McCoy for sponsors, being black Cuban men in predominantly white American communities, finding jobs, which was sometimes difficult, and starting families. Life hasn't always been easy. Most of their fellow Cubans left the area after leaving Fort McCoy. So why did these guys stay? Some, like Erne, had great sponsors that became family. He fell in love, had kids, found a job. Marcos found a job and a family here too. But his reason to stay is part of a bigger plan. To be honest, I don't want to really be in Miami, California, or any of those places where people speak Spanish. I want to go to some place where I'm going to learn the language, I'm going to learn the way. Mm-hmm. If I stay out there in Miami, I got some relatives out there in, in Florida. But when I come to Fort McCoy, I say, I already know Spanish. Where am I going to go to some place where I'm going to have to, no matter what, still learn English so I can survive, you know? So I say, might as well stay here in some way, somehow I am obligated myself to learn it. Marcos is resilient. He's constantly growing. He doesn't want the easy way out. He keeps trying to make it. And this is such a core instinct of being a migrant. You are wired for survival. And when you're wired for survival, sometimes you're just trying to make it through the day. And that can lead you to making decisions that haunt you later in life. I did have a dream to come to this country and go pretty much to everywhere in the whole world, you know. uh, That dream is still pending. On the next episode of Uprooted... We were selling dopes, Mm -hmm. you know. We were stealing. We were doing the, the crazy thing, you know. I went to prison for 22 years. I'm not proud of, you know, but, you know, it's something that, you know, uh, always, you know, stick on me. Drugs, jail time, and the attempted murder of a notorious serial killer from Wisconsin. Uprooted is reported, written, and produced by me, executive producer Maureen McCollum, along with Omar Granados. Our producer and technical director is Brad Kohlberg. We're edited by Brady Carlson. Music direction and composition by Carl Christensen. Voice work by Dom Johnson. Additional support from Adam Friedrich, Peter Bryant, Hannah Haynes, and Ezra Wall. Digital editing by Alyssa Alamand. The digital design team is Jane Jumale, Amanda Starich, and Anna Rudin. Digital direction by David Highland. Photography by Angela Major, and special thanks to the University of Wisconsin La Crosse's Murphy Library for archival photos. Artwork by Grace Lorenz. Our theme music is the song Bozo Part 3 by Willie Chirino. Additional music from La Familia Valera Miranda, Compay Segundo, and Pio Leva. Archival audio from NPR's research, archives, and data strategy team. You can see more at wpr.org uprooted. 